So these ladies are from Hospice. This morning, <coughs> and then um, I would donor network they will be here. So the second part of the meeting to talk about their job. So, um, Barb, if you want to introduce yourself. Okay. All right. Is this on? This is on for your purposes. Okay, sounds good. So this is gonna be recorded, so we're gonna be talking into the microphone. I tend to talk with my hands though, so stop me if you know, the microphone's flying around. So I am Barb Godfrey from Hospice of North Iowa, and this is Diane Husted. So we are both nurses. Diane is one of the home care nurses, so she's one of our experts here, and I brought her along to help me today. I'm a nurse, but my role is very unique. I travel out in our 10 counties, and I provide public education. So I will stop here at um, Franklin General, the nursing homes, assisted livings, any public agency, just to get the word out about hospice services, but the benefits of earlier referrals. A lot of families, a lot of individuals in the community still think we're just for those last few days or those last few hours, and that's simply just not true. We're at least a six-month benefit, and when people are signed up with hospice services even earlier, you know, they can live longer, have a better quality of life, and can outlive that that six month mark as long as they still qualify according to Medicare guidelines. As you know, everything is bound by Medicare guidelines to start services with Hospice of North Iowa and to remain on services. And as far as if somebody meets criteria or not, just give us a call and we'll figure that out together. So I never want you to struggle with having to have that decision. It takes two doctors to make that decision if somebody's hospice appropriate or not. So we have patients and families that just call themselves and say, hey, we need help, not sure if you're the right place to call. I will meet with individuals and families, explain our services, and we'll just take it from there. So again, anybody can make that referral, anybody can make that first phone call just to get the education out there. I just met with a family last week, um, you know, met with them, they're, um, son had ALS or has ALS. He doesn't quite qualify quite yet, but as we see that decline, um, they'll be ready for our services hopefully early on and we'll be able to serve him for many, many months. In the meantime, I got him a lot of community resources. He's a veteran. There's some home health care that can come into the home. So again, that's a lot of my role. So I'm leaving some business cards here. Please call if you have any questions. Um, but today we're gonna to show you a DVD. It is produced by Barbara Carnes, who wrote the Blue Book. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with the Blue Book that's in every hospice packet, and we've got copies of that over here. But this is a DVD that she produced, and we feel it's very effective. So what we wanna do is just show some segments of it, and then we're gonna talk a little bit. So um, I'm gonna get started with this. Now bear with me with the DVD. Um, I'm gonna show a little snippet and then we'll stop it here, so. Okay, this is where you need to bear with me. <laughs> Months before death, a person will 
gradually stop eating. It starts with they stop eating meat, and then pretty soon it's fruits and vegetables. Then it's anything that requires energy to digest. Then you're doing good to get soft food, scrambled eggs, puddings, ice cream. Ice cream goes a long way. We love our ice cream. And then it's protein supplements, Ensure Plus, um, instant breakfast. And then it's sips of water or Gatorade. The hardest thing for me to get people to understand is that when a person has entered the dying process, it's okay not to eat. Food is what holds us in our body. Food is the anchor that holds us, that gives us grounding. And if the body's preparing to die, it doesn't want the food or the grounding. Um, it's trying to <laughs> let go. We have such a hard time with this emotionally because food is so intertwined in our life. But what's the bottom line? The bottom line with food is we eat to live. It's the gas we put in our car to get around in. And if the body's preparing to die, then all by itself, it will cut back and stop eating. And what I've learned is that they want to eat. They want to eat for us because they see what it does to us when they don't eat. But the new rule is not to force food. Always offer, just don't force. On this continuum, at a point of about here, a person will not be taking in enough fluids for hydration. And then I'll often hear, well, we better get an IV going because I don't want mom to get dehydrated. The new rule is that dehydration is part of the normal, natural way that a person dies. Always offer, but when on this continuum, a person is here on the line, they're one to three weeks, they're weeks from death, and their body isn't working right. Nothing in their body is working right and their kidneys aren't working right. And so that fluid that you're putting in in an IV just builds up and up and it fills up the lungs and a person drowns to death. If I were to ask you, how would you like to die? My guess is that most people would say, Barbara, I just wanna go to sleep and not wake up. When a person is dehydrated, the electrolytes in their bloodstream get out of whack and their calcium goes up. And when your calcium goes up high enough, you close your eyes and you go to sleep and you don't wake up. On a continuum, Oopsie. months before. There we go. All right. Okay, so we're going to break this down. So we're going to talk about um, food and the hydration here in just a minute. I'm going to pass this off to Diane. So, you know, I should have said, so when somebody is thinking about hospice services, that's somebody who has a serious right, a terminal illness, a diagnosis, and two physicians agree that in their best opinion, life expectancy is six months or less. And the individual and the family's goals are on comfort, meaning they don't want to go to the hospital anymore. They don't want any more fancy tests. They just want to be comfortable and with their loved ones. So again, we're hoping that's for many, many months. 
when Barbara Carnes breaks this down, it is towards the end of the spectrum. So again, I just want you to keep in mind, it's always a transition, and a lot of this is towards the end of the spectrum. But this is gonna talk about food and hydration, and I'm gonna pass this off to Diane. Okay, questions about, I mean, have you had experiences maybe is the best way to start this off? Let's talk about that maybe. What kind of experiences have you had with end of life and the whole eating issue? Well, I went through with both my parents, with my siblings, because it was really hard for them. I knew what was going on. I'm trying to explain to them what was going on, but they had a really hard time. But you gotta make your dreams something. You know, you so something. this kind of hit home for you, didn't it? Yeah. Okay, all right. Any other experiences, anything? Well, I was sitting at a restaurant said to them, that, you know, they were trying to ease the pain or they were trying, they just didn't get it. They just don't think there's enough education. Yeah. That it has to be a mindset. But we are such a culture of food. We Absolutely. Are such, we put love in, in our tummies and that's what we're brought up. Women are to cook and bake and, you know, those kinds of things. And we're, we're such a culture of food. Absolutely. You think that it's yeah. so hard. Absolutely. You think about why families even get together. It's Thanksgiving, it's Christmas, it's always around food, Easter, those kinds of holidays, absolutely. So that whole culture is definitely, yeah, you spot on. So what we notice with our dying patients oftentimes is that whole, you know, they need to drink something, they need to have something. Um, one of the things I like to tell people is, and it's kind, of, it's kind of simple then as a nurse to explain it, that if you put something in your system and the body's not processing it, it's going to cause them distress. It's going to cause them pain or nausea or something. And sometimes something that simple explained to the family helps them along the way. And then maybe some of what, you've, what you'll catch on this today will help you explain it to them as well. Do you have any input on that, Barb? The blue sheet, yeah. Yeah, so we were just going to say we did pass around a couple of sheets here. One is he just won't eat anymore. <coughs> the other one is beyond chicken soup. So if that would be helpful for resources. Um, you know, we can leave copies. You can go ahead and make copies of those, too, as a resource. And again, utilize us. If you have any questions at all, please utilize us. We'd love to come down and talk with families, you know, even before they're on hospice services. Any other questions or discussion on the food, the IV part of it? Absolutely, and she touched on that on the video as well. And we notice people with kidney failure, especially. Those are the ones who just go to sleep and go. You know, they, it might start off with a little confusion, those kinds of things happen, and we see that. But typically <coughs> then they just go to sleep and that's probably the most comfortable way for people to pass from this life for sure. And in this facility, I know we've seen a couple instances of that. I've worked with some of you. So absolutely, spot on, yep. earlier, um, Doug had ALS too, and we got hospice kind of as a resource for me also because you're not as objective, you know, when it's your husband. But um, they came in, had massage therapy, so that gave me a chance to go shower, you know, and get away for an hour. Um, so it, it is, it's wonderful, and it doesn't have to be when they're actively dying. Absolutely. So, yeah. In addition to massage, um, are you all familiar with all the services that we provide? Okay. Okay. Social worker, she helps a lot. And again, I think um, the instruction family on this food and water, you know, early on to say what do you want 
you know, because I knew exactly what my husband wanted. They just need to talk about it. But many people do not like to talk about dying. Absolutely. And when people are signing up for hospice initially, that we do an eye post and a lot of that gets brought up with that you know do you want tube feedings do you want you know IVs do you want all that kind of stuff or is it comfort cares only that you want and when those questions get asked then there's just so much information that they're getting at that time I think that that gets pushed to the background and it just needs to be reinforced yeah day to day all the time absolutely yep yeah so hospice in addition to massage therapy and well the nurse the nurse has to come a minimum of once every 14 days 15, 14 days. But we also have a social worker, a chaplain, we have the massage therapy, music therapy, there are volunteers available. And people, we have people that utilize volunteers just for someone to come in and read to, to them. It gets to a point where some people can't hold a book, you know, they can't turn the pages, there's different things like that, but they love it. And then the, our volunteers, I mean, they can come <coughs> in multiple times a week even. Nurses, like I said, they have to come once every 14 days, but they could come as often as every day depending on what's going on with the family. And then the social worker, they're usually there a couple times a week. The um, chaplain's there, again, as needed normally, but at least once a month. Um, and then hospice um, music therapy is usually once a month. And the massage therapy is usually every other week, but then again, depending on how much benefit they get, you know, we can, it's individual, case by case, what the patient needs and what works best for them. So there's quite a few different things that we do offer. And in the home, that is, like you said, it's a lot of help. It's an hour so that caregiver can take a shower, do whatever they need to do. Yeah. I do take a shower. <laughs> I am glad to hear that, Diane. <laughs> right. But I'm really glad you mentioned that, and it's um, the timing of this. So when I shared my story about meeting with the family last week with a gentleman who has ALS, um, again, he, he's not at the point where he needs hospice services yet, but like we talked about, we were able to provide him some other services. One of those being palliative care, which is separate from hospice, but um, it's more of an outpatient setting where, and there's an office up in Mason City, the VA also has a palliative care department, and they talk about what are your goals. They talk about these hard conversations. So I was able to provide this family with information. Um, and I have another book here, excuse me, Diane, that does require a doctor's referral. And if you have any questions on that, I can help you with that. Again, I, I, it's not my department, but I, I know how to help you with that. This is a great resource. It's not just for hospice folks. It's for anybody with a serious illness, hard choices for loving people. Um, but it talks about when you're filling out the eye posts, you know, what does this look like in reality versus what people see on TV shows? It's on page 12, it breaks it down with statistics of realistic outcomes. It talks about feeding tubes. And my point being, I was able to give this resource to this family because they're gonna have to make a decision at some point, you know, if when the swallowing gets difficult, would my loved one want a feeding tube? It talks about, you know, ventilation and all of that. So it's a great resource. It also talks about what's palliative care, what's hospice care. So again, just getting the education out there, and you're right, we as a society, we do not like to talk about death. We don't like to talk about decline. We don't like to talk about what if I need assisted living? What if I need a nursing home? These are just hard conversations, but, we need to have them and figure out a way to, to have them. So these are resources. So, um, and then we also have bereavement that follows families one year following the loss. And we actually have a support group coming up in Hampton and it starts on the 13th, so just um, in two days. And this is at the First Christian Church. So this is for anybody who's experienced a loss of any kind, not just through hospice services. So it's for any adult who's experienced a death any kind at any time. It could have been 10, 13, 20 years ago. So if um, anybody's interested in this, it's not too late to sign up or any of your families you take care of, anybody in the community, all they have to do is call our office and ask for our bereavement department. So, all right, so we interjected a lot here, which I'm glad because I wanted to be able to cover everything with our services. We're gonna go back to the video here and this one's gonna talk about sleep. Death <coughs> habits change two three four months before death occurs they're going to start taking an afternoon nap and then it's a morning and an afternoon nap then it's a morning nap an afternoon nap they're asleep all evening in front of the tv you wake them up you put them to bed 
and then one day they don't get out of bed and then they're asleep more than they're awake. When a person is asleep more than they're awake, their world changes. And this world is no longer their reality. The dream world becomes their world. And we'll say, oh, you know, he's confused. He's delusional. He's talking about his world because <coughs> his, everything is like a dream at this point. When you're weeks before death, you can wake him up. If pain isn't an issue, wake him up. You can talk to him, carry on a conversation, and they're going to go back to sleep when you leave, and they're not going to know or care if they dreamt your visit or if you were really there. Everything becomes like a dream. The new rule for end of life in regards to sleep is that sleep is your friend. You use sleep to your advantage. The body is letting go of its hold on, in, on this planet and it's building its place in the other world. All right, so talking about sleep. So Diana, I'm gonna let you come back here and utilize this. And can you hear us okay with this? If you <coughs> yeah, I'm terrible at that. I talk with my hands more than she does probably. So this white sheet that you have as far as new rules, did everybody get a copy of this one? On the very bottom of this front side, it talks about the sleep. And when it is end of life, truly, there's not a lot of energy. I had someone explain the amount of energy a person has at end of life as a, a fist. This is your energy, this is what you have. You have to breathe if you're eating, if you're doing anything at all, that takes energy. There's not a whole lot left. That sleep gives you that energy. So at end of life, truly, when it's getting that close, if they want to communicate, if they want to have family in, you know, if those are the important things at end of life, the whole community thing, that sleep is going to be what gives them the energy to do that because generally they're, they're not eating much, they're not drinking much, those things are taking place. And that's what's kind of explained here as well on the bottom of this sheet. Um, <clears throat> so the idea is to conserve the energy, sleep before you want to do something, and sleep after it's done. Conserve your energy. Schedule the day and prioritize activities around the increased need for sleep. That's kind of what we're just saying. And remember, our body is like a battery. Sleep recharges it. So if they're sleeping a lot, you know there's not a lot of energy. They just don't have anything left. Does anybody want to talk about anything they've experienced with that? Is that pretty straightforward, isn't it? Okay. I guess one thing that I've heard a lot, though, is um, there will be a day with lots of sleep, and then the next day that seems to be... I don't know if I'll call it the rally, but just lots of energy and everything seems perfect. And then families are like, oh my goodness, maybe we don't need hospice services, you know, but take the good days as they come, right? And, and enjoy them and embrace them. But again, it is like the body's like a battery, it needs recharging. So, all right, so that's sleep. We're going to go to pain next. It's not painful. Dying does not cause pain. Disease causes pain. So you're going to look at a person's disease history to understand end of life pain. We watchers of the dying process are identifying it as it looks painful. Dying itself is not. The person so removed from their physical body that they don't experience it in the same way that we who have a firm grip on this planet feel it. So you're going, there are a lot of diseases that do not have pain. If the disease history is one of no pain, then just because a person is dying does not mean that they now have pain 
and that a narcotic is appropriate. When pain is not a part of the disease process and the person is days to weeks from death, their body feels heavy, it's tired, there's an ache all over. Well, you wouldn't take a narcotic if you had the flu for the discomfort. You'd take a couple of ibuprofen. Well, that's what you're going to take in the weeks before death if a person is feeling achy and tired all over. You're not gonna take a narcotic just because they're in the dying process. When a person is on pain medicine, particularly on a narcotic, the, their bowel patterns change. Narcotics and any kind of pain medicine slows down the movement of the intestine. And even if you don't eat, remember, we're not eating here like we normally would, you still are going to have to go with pain management. There must be a laxative as part of the program. If pain has been a part of the disease process, <coughs> and there's a lot of disease out there that has pain, then you are going to treat that pain until the person's last breath. There is no reason today for any person to die in pain. And if someone says to me, we've done everything we can and this person is still in pain, then my answer is, you have not done everything. Okay. We're getting some response here, so. <laughs> Response. We better talk about this. Absolutely. Flip your page over for the new rules. It talks about pain, and we've ex we've all experienced this, haven't we? Just working in this facility, you've had people in here that at end of life are in a lot of pain, and there are people that really haven't had much at all. I've seen it myself here with some of my patients. Kidney failure it didn't seem very painful. You know, if respiratory issues became an issue, sometimes we use a narcotic because it helps relax that smooth muscle. They breathe better, absolutely. But when it comes to pain, yeah, it's, you're not going to get addicted at this point in time. It doesn't happen. What kind of questions? I know there's probably things out there. You guys have all dealt with different things. Let's start with that. There are still nurses here. I mean, I, I just... And that's the stigma. It truly is out there. That's that conversation at the table. That, we hear that all the time. But truly, when it's end of life, the body is shutting down anyway, and we don't want them going out of this life running a marathon. If you see increased heart rate, if you see increased respirations, you know they're working hard. There's something going on. They're not comfortable. That alone, even if they can't tell you anymore that it's pain, there's something uncomfortable, and we need to treat that. Absolutely. You all just want me to die. That's what you want. That was awful. That was awful. We were getting IV stuff. We were just getting oral stuff. It just was not enough. Like she said, yeah. whatever we were doing was not enough. Right. So as the video told you, if that kind of thing is happening and you know it's pain, then it's not too much. It's absolutely not too much. Um, it's important, too, that remember, hospice is a team. There's chaplains. We have that whole spiritual side of things. In addition to the, the medical, the nursing side of things, and the social worker, we can call in other people to help out, and especially in a case where you have a patient who is scared. 
you know, we definitely want to call in the chaplain. We want to bring them some peace if we can at all at end of life. And family helps with that as well, in addition to, you know, just. You know, as a nurse, I think family is important. And, and then, you know, I don't think just. I know, right. Absolutely. Yeah. But that's one of the benefits of doing these in services is, you know, just let people know it's, there's other services available. Use the team. We're there to help you. We didn't touch on anything else with reference to pain, but is there anything that throws you guys that you think? Because we are, we are the ones that are going to actually educate now. You know, you're learning this, hopefully, as these <coughs> things come up, and you're talking to people about maybe they're not on hospice services yet, but maybe they sh should be, in your opinion. You know, helping you to understand what this is, too, can help them get the care that they need and the comfort that they deserve. And sometimes we've run into that families are resistant or there may be a patient that might be resistant. Maybe we'll talk about addiction here in a minute, but sometimes there has been a history um, of, of addiction. And so there is a lot of fear that comes with that. Um, I remember taking care of a gentleman who, that was his fear because he had been, um, he had been recovered for many, many, many years. And that was very, very important to him. So we just had to talk that through. He also had a lot of pain. So again, utilizing the team, our social workers really helped with those conversations um, and just kind of getting to what's the source of this, you know, to getting to what can we really uncover here so we can have these conversations and be as effective as we can. And when Diane mentioned the spiritual part of it, um, just... I've talked to a lot of our um, inpatient nurses, and patients will hang on and hang on and just seem unsettled. And there was one case where it, it seemed to be more of a spiritual concern. And so we brought in our chaplain, and it was not long after the chaplain was in there, um, the patient was able to pass peacefully. So I just, I believe every story I hear, and I'm amazed by all those different stories, but there's so much to it. You know, we've got our physical being, our emotional being, our spiritual being. So. There's, so again, yep, utilize the team. And if we can answer any questions, even if they're not on hospice services or if you're working with a physician and maybe just we're not all on the same page, if we can help in any way or give some tips, we definitely will do that. Okay, so this next part is on addiction. body there is a line between pain and no pain and in end of life care and pain management the goal is to find this line it takes days often to find this line you have to literally play with the medicine to find this line in acute <coughs> Let's say someone has uh, an appendectomy and they've had surgery and had their um, appendix removed. They have pain. They are given a pain shot and they go to sleep. The reason they go to sleep is because that narcotic has gone beyond the line of pain. But in acute care, you don't have time to find the line. So you automatically give a little more than you believe the pain is that they have. The problem comes if consistently that line is surpassed. Then, over a period of time, there will be addiction. The other fear that people have is that there's going, you're going to over overdose. Well, End-of-life professionals are experts in pain management, in end-of-life pain management. They know that they have to find this thin line. And here's what we look for that will say we've given too much. It starts over here, the person goes to sleep. Well, now that's kind of... Um, a two-edged sword in that they can be totally exhausted and go to sleep for the first time in a long time. 
but you're going to watch that sleeping. And then the next thing that's going to happen is they're going to have um, slurred speech, thick tongue. They're going to be confused. And then it's seeing little green men on the ceiling. And then their breathing slows down and gets slower and slower. And then they stop breathing. But there's all these things that we look for that say we have exceeded the line between no pain and pain. And what do you do when you've exceeded it? You cut back on the medication. You cut back maybe on the time that you're going to give it next. You cut back on the amount. Now, let's talk about time. Because what often happens is we find this line and the person is comfortable. And then the next time I go into the home, I hear, oh, you know, he was doing so good that we stopped taking the pain medicine. And now he's hurting again. Whatever's there causing the pain, it's still there. So you have to keep the cover on. And that means you have to take the medicine around the clock on a regular basis. The person that's dying is processing. I, I don't know. Pressing that too hard or something. Um, I do want to say I used to work in a pain clinic, and so addiction would come up an awful lot. And so what I want to say about that is what I had learned that you know there's a difference between dependence on a medication and that addiction. And the addiction is a behavior, you know that 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 with time and repeated doses and all of that develops. So again, I think we use addiction pretty loosely. And so I just wanted to to mention that. Again, there's a need for this medication, and um, you know, as long as the per person's not doing whatever it takes to get that medication, you know, sometimes people with addictions will do whatever it takes to get that medication. So there's a difference, especially at end of life here. One of the things I wanted to mention about that whole addiction thing, we've had different patients with different situations. Some have had a lot of pain. And some of them ha were addicted before they ever came to us. And some of those take a lot of medication to get them comfortable and keep them that way. Mm -hmm. We also have some that come in that don't have any pain. And all of a sudden, they're breathing really fast. And all of a sudden, you know, see these signs that say that there's person struggling. We have medications that we order for our patients that are scheduled medications, for especially those who are needing it all the time for whether it's disease, pain, addiction issues.